Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Higher Ed Conversations webinar series. Um, I'm Andrew Keating. I'm Senior Director for Industries here at Cumulo. This is our third Higher Ed Conversations. Uh, last week, we kicked off a conversation about Cumulo's RecoverQ solution, and we talked about business continuity strategies and how RecoverQ can be uh, a part of that. Today, I'm really pleased to be joined by my colleague, David Snyderman, our product marketing leader here at Cumulo. And we're going to continue that conversation about RecoverQ, but, but today we're really going to focus in on ransomware and ransomware mitigation. So the threat that it poses, uh, I think most of us are sort of familiar with ransomware. It's in the news. It's this growing threat. Uh, but we're going to talk again about the RecoverQ solution. Um, we're going to talk about how RecoverQ can help higher education education and some of the considerations that colleges and universities should take into account when they're building their defenses against this, this threat from ransomware. We will have time for your questions, so I encourage you uh, to add them in uh, to the chat as we go. Um, if we don't have time to get through everything, don't worry, we'll follow up with you offline. Um, if a question comes to you later, you can always reach out to us as well. So we really want to have this be uh, a conversation and a dialogue, um, so please don't be shy about posting those questions as we go. Well, with that, um, I will turn things over to, to David, who's going to share a little bit about um, the, the ransomware threat. David. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so as Andrew mentioned, and, and we're all aware of this, I mean, if you're reading the news, you know, uh, ransomware attacks are on the rise, and uh, it's, a, it's a serious problem. So we're great to have you all here today to talk about that. But in addition to ransomware, there are other threats that are, um, you know, out there that you need to be aware of, and they've always been there, really. I mean, weather events or, you know, uh, other things that could take your data center down. So unexpected power outages, or or even, you know, someone inside your your organization who uh, makes a mistake and and affects your data that way. So lots of different reasons to start thinking about how you're going to protect your data. Um, and, you know, let, let's talk about ransomware for a minute, though, because um, we're hearing so much about that and I know you are as well. And so let, let's uh, start there and talk about what that threat looks like. And so here's an interesting slide with some stats that these are global across all industries. Um, but, you know, the main message with this is that ransomware attacks are on the rise. And uh, what's changing, though, is that uh, we find that the attacks uh, are affecting other organizations beyond just the, you know, the obvious sort of big fish or the enormous ransoms that could be, you know, uh, demanded. They're moving downstream to all kinds of targets of all different sizes. So basically, this means that, you know, everyone is vulnerable uh, to attack here. And, um, you know, for large research organizations or higher ed, you have entire departments that, you know, work against uh, uh, these types of threats and protecting your network and keeping it safe. But, you know, other folks that run small organizations or small institutions that may not have those resources are, could be victims as well. So it's really important that everyone, no matter how big your organization is, is prepared and take some smart steps to make sure that you're not vulnerable to, to attacks of, from ransomware or really any of the other threats that could affect your data. Yeah, and uh, David, if I could jump in, and, and sorry for kind of uh, uh, getting ahead of things there with the slides there, accidentally clicking forward a little too early. Um, I, I wanted to jump in because, you know, in addition to what you said, um, higher ed specifically is under attack. Um, and so, you know, a variety of sources and security organizations have noted that colleges and universities are, are vastly, um, you know, disproportionately affected uh, compared with other industries. So this is some data from Microsoft Security Intelligence Center, really cool website. You can go check that out. They, they you know, produce data and, and post it up there on an ongoing basis. But um, just in the last 30 days, they're tracking, you know, millions of attacks, over 7 million attacks. Now, to be clear, this is all malware. So this is this is a broader category than simply ransomware. Uh, this is the sort of overall scope of, of malware that they were encountering and tracking in the last 30 days. But you see in the chart that higher ed, I mean, it's orders of magnitude different from uh, and more intense than business and professional services or some of these other industries. So, you know, we tend to think about ransomware, we tend to think about malware as affecting like financial services organizations. We hear about it affecting healthcare organizations, but actually it's colleges and universities 
uh, that that are that are seeing the brunt of these attacks. Um, also important to note that some ransom demands are now exceeding a million dollars. Um, you know, some of them are much smaller than that. They they really range in um, they range in in the terms of the dollar amounts involved. But um, you know, one of these could could involve a, a million dollar plus uh, ransom demand. Uh, and I think the other thing that has made you know ransomware especially challenging and difficult. Uh, for higher ed and and for other organizations as well, is the, you know the realities of the pandemic and remote work. Um, so you know universities have always been open places, large numbers of students, faculty, staff. But then when you combine that with people working at home, uh, the IT staff, the security staff, maybe being distributed, um, that exacerbates the problem because that makes it a little bit more challenging to respond to an incident, to understand what's going on, um, even to just communicate and collaborate in, in some cases to try to figure out um, you know, how, to, how to respond to, to an incident. So, you know, David, I'll pass it back to you now to talk about after, after this kind of, uh, you know, grim reality of the attacks that, that colleges are facing, um, you know, David would love to hear more about Recover Q and kind of how, um, you know, how schools can, um, you know, respond and, and confront and sort of help build their strategies to defend against this. Yeah, absolutely. And you raise a good point about, you know, the, the sort of the makeup of um, users on the network uh, in higher education. So you've got a whole variety of endpoints. Um, some are managed, some are not. So, I mean, when we think about um, our data protection, let's take a holistic point of view here. So endpoint protection is important. You need to do that. You also have network protection, but you really need to think about data protection. And this is where we can come in with Recover Queue. So I'm going to step through some of the uh, like the four pillars, how the, the holistic uh, package that we see when we talk about uh, data protection and what Recover Queue does. And I'm going to start with uh, defense because the defending against an attack is just the, you know, the most practical way to reduce your risk profile, right? So you want to make sure that you have uh, uh, an infrastructure that's just hard to attack to begin with. And there are some fundamental things about the way Cumulo is designed from the core up that make uh, this especially robust um, in the industry. So first of all, um, we run on a very uh, specialized lockdown Linux kernel. So it's not a big wide distributed operating system that you know millions and hundreds of millions of uh, or billions of devices run. It's it's uh, pretty unique, and so that alone makes it harder to to attack because it's less known. The other thing is anything that uh, can access your data, so protocols, uh, we write the, those in house, and we we design all of those with security in mind. So again, this is similar to the operating system um, point that I mentioned, is that we're not using third party libraries or other distributions that might be vulnerable. So an attack on those does not affect Cumulo. Um, further, only the Cumulo software runs, Cumulo core runs on the hardware nodes, no other apps do. Um, and even our application, Cumulo core, is uh, sort of locked down in a way. It runs in what we call user space. So uh, even if that were compromised, it's very limited in terms of what the damage could be done there because our uh, our software has no permissions to do some you know some of the other things that an admin would when it's running so these are just all part of a security profile that just make cumulo core uh, robust and resilient to attack to begin with now within defense you can add uh so we've got we've got a really sort of robust strong structure now we're going to put locks on the doors so to speak with some features that allow you to control who comes and goes and who can have access to what data. So all the features you'd expect in an enterprise product, a mature one like ours. So we've got role-based access control. We've got share permissions. We've got file permissions, um, ways to restrict what users can do and how they, they can access the data. So that's all really very important to locking down uh, access to your data to begin with. Now, those are not foolproof. Right? You can have a user that has permissions, but then makes a mistake. For example, let's think about that rather than you know, thinking only about threat actors, it's possible you can have someone who should be uh, able to access some data and then accidentally deletes it or whatever. Or you know, there's lots of, lots of reasons uh, to be uh, concerned about that. So we talk about detection next. And so what this looks like is a way for you to see uh, access and usage patterns in real time on your cluster 
to spot things that look odd to you. Like for example, let's take that um, instance where you have a trusted user on your network who you know um, is writing a script or doing something that's creating a ton of files by accident, or maybe it's deleting a ton of files. So you can see in your real time data in our dashboard, uh, you can see uh, file activity. You can see uh, activity by IP address. You can see activity by user or directory. So even if you run a, a huge cluster with billions of files, we still present real-time data that lets you see what's happening in the moment. So that's one way to do it. Um, the, other, the other thing that we do is uh, we use log auditing. So we've got an audit feature that logs all access and you know, describes what the user had done and what they had touched and, and so on. Um, those logs can be parsed out through our API to another tool for real-time analysis and, or deeper uh, log analysis um, to really uh, detect what's happening. Now, when you're talking about ransomware, it's really important to uh, detect it early and act quickly because as the malware ransomware uh, you know, spreads in your ecosystem, it can do you know, increasingly more levels of damage. So you got to detect it early and stop it as soon as you can. And this is where the real-time uh, analytics and our log auditing and so on come into play here. So that's really important. Um, the third thing is now we step into, well, you know, so you do detect something, now what do you do about it? Uh, Third-party tools can be used in the detection piece as well. So you can set up automatic remediation. But if we wanna talk about uh, what you can do to recover from file, uh, file loss or some other type of ransomware, Let's look at the recover and resume pieces. So um, we have snapshots that allow you to uh, take very lightweight uh, with very low overhead uh, snapshots of you know, the file states in a moment in time and preserve those. And so you can roll back to a previous version of an individual file, an entire directory, or the whole cluster if you need to. Um, another cool feature here is that we support Windows previous versions, so end users can roll back to a previous version of the file themselves, which you know helps reduce uh, help desk calls and, and that type of thing, so they can serve themselves. Now, imagine that you have snapshots, but for some reason, uh, your entire cluster is affected by malware or ransomware, which is also gonna affect those snapshots. So that's not helpful. You need to keep your snapshots in multiple locations. And so we can replicate snapshots to other environments, either another cumulative cluster, or we can replicate them to AWS or an, another place that you want to save those snapshots so that you always have uh, backups in other regions and, uh, and so on. So you've got some uh, uh, additional layers of protection there. And then when we talk about resumption, so this means if your business or your organization or your institution really can't tolerate any offline at all, you need to have a failover policy. And so RecoverQ helps you do that. Uh, we can do that to another cluster by replicating to another cluster on-prem. So you could have another build out somewhere, uh, another campus or so on. Or you could also use the cloud to do this because uh, Cumulative Core software runs, uh, it's actually the same code that runs either on-prem or in the cloud. So you can create an instance of Cumulo in any of the cloud providers and you can keep it uh, updated with uh, you know, replication of the latest data to, to the cloud. And then should you need to, you can quickly uh, spin up that instance, or if it's already running, you can scale it to meet your production demands. So make it an active cluster um, on demand. So this is really great because while, you know, in normal mode, when you don't need your, your failover, you can save costs by running it at sort of a, a lower, uh, lower active uh, rate. So, you know, lower compute. And when you need the extra performance, you can do that dynamically in the cloud and you can cut over to it. So not only is your data there, but all your applications, everything's configured, it's all ready to go. And you just cut over to that while you remediate what's happening on prem or in your active cluster. And then, so the, the last part of resumption, so you're, you're now on your sort of backup, um, your alternate site, when you're ready to revert everything back to your primary cluster, you can just flip the, re the replication relationship so that you take the latest data that's been created by your users in that alternate, alternate environment, move it back to your primary, and then switch the replication and everyone will fail back to the primary, 
primary um, uh, instance. So these are some of the four you know, key areas of recovery queue. And um, this might help you get a better sense of you know, sort of what to consider when you're building a holistic data protection, backup, and disaster recovery solution. Great. Uh, thank you, David. Um, well, I think what we're going to do now, we've got about 10 minutes or so left. Um, we're going to stop uh, the slides. And I've got a few questions for you, David, um, and then encourage everybody attending to um, you know, add your questions into the chat. We'll try to take as many of them uh, as we can. Again, if we don't get to everything, um, you know, glad to kind of follow up um, offline as needed. But I think first and foremost, David, and we talked a little bit about this question um, you know, on last week's session, but I know for many uh, colleges and universities, you know, they've heavily invested in, in SaaS tools especially during the pandemic with the shift to remote. Uh, you know, Zoom became this kind of household, household word for many of us, uh, especially in higher ed. You know, they have cloud-based learning management systems, you know, in some cases, cloud-based, um, you know, storage and collaboration tools. So I, I think one question is kind of where does RecoverQ fit into that landscape? And, and maybe a different sort of spin on that is if a, if a university has invested heavily in kind of SaaS and cloud tools, you know, don't they already have kind of some level of protection, you know, based on what those those SaaS cloud providers are doing? And essentially, you know, where does where does this fit um, in, into that landscape? Yeah, that's a great question. And so when we think back about that holistic point of view, to the extent that you want to keep your data in multiple places and keep it safe, you're going to need to think about um, that as your overall strategy. So SaaS is great in, in the sense that you know it relieves that burden on the admin to you know do the types of things we talked about because that's a hosted service. But many institutions need to have data on prem for a variety of reasons. You know the, maybe for local performance uh, to control costs, or there could be some data governance uh, policy or something else that means you, they can't put it in, in the cloud directly or they, they don't want to. And so they, to the extent that you have data on-prem, um, you'll want to have a solution like I described to make sure that it's, you know, it's, it's kept safe from attack. Um, you know, even though, um, even though you, you might have your data host in the cloud, there are, there are some reasons why you want to have that local backup as well or have local data. So that's one aspect to, to that, answer that question. Andrew, do you know, what do you think about, what are you seeing out there that you feel might inform this? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think one, uh, something else I would add into that is, you know, when I kind of talk to people in higher ed, you know, these are very sort of heterogeneous spaces when it comes to IT. So even if, you know, it's it's classically kind of one of everything, right? Because you also have like a, a bring your own device, bring your own uh, cloud tool, like a professor decides to use some app, whether central IT knows about it or not. Uh, there's so many of these stories out there. And, and so I think, you know, one sort of other point to consider beyond what you've said is just the fact that, you're never going to be 100% in any kind of SaaS solution. You're always going to have either a local cluster or file shares that are managed by a department over here or that central IT does for certain use cases it, and then cloud solutions as well for other things. So it's really just this, this kind of heterogeneous um, landscape and i think what you shared around recover Q and the kind of cumulo core capabilities um, are really important for any university that is thinking about the file data and really and i know um you know david we talked about this as as well um in in getting ready for this session that kind of another spin on this question another thing to think about is you know that universities have invested heavily in in security tools um, you know, they've, they've got a whole range of security tools. They've done a lot to try to educate users, you know, don't click that link in the unknown email or don't respond, um, you know, it, it, in terms of addressing the user psychology of it, you know, many of them are looking at or implementing kind of zero trust type parameters. So I think there's a sort of similar question. I'd love to get your thoughts on this around, um, you know, where, 
the sort of security of file data and the kind of recover queue type capabilities that you shared fit into that landscape. Essentially, if I've invested in a bunch of these other you know, third party security tools that are designed to you know, do many of the things that you talked about, um, you know, essentially, why do I need that in, in a file data platform? Yeah, no, that, that's a great point, and thanks for bringing that up. Uh, so I, I would answer this in a couple ways. I mean, first of all, it's important to have a solid foundation, like I mentioned earlier. So remediation tools or third party tools that sit on top to help prevent, detect or, you know, recover from something would work a whole lot better if your underlying systems are resilient to attack to begin with. So that's important. Um, and the other thing is that all of the features that I described are included in Cumulocore which is great news if you're a Cumulo customer already, everything we talked about today, you already have, you, you can turn it on today. Uh, so that's really important. And so the way we approach this is, you know, there's a better together story with us and all uh, the third party ecosystem. So for example, if you are using backup tools, uh, if you are using, you know, log analysis tools or, or other things on your network, uh, we can work with those. We have REST APIs for, for really every feature that's in Cumulo, there's an API for that. So you can connect your tools to it. Um, and it's really designed to work great on its own if that's all you need. But if you need more, then absolutely, you, you plug in your third-party tools to that and it's going to work really well. So yeah, I mean, I think that you could look at this um, from that approach that, you know, your files need to be secure. And so you use something to begin with that you know is really going to be resilient and then augment it if you want with with more um and if you already own those things great you can you can definitely use them great um well i i know we only have kind of a few minutes left here david so one thing um just conceptually i i would love to kind of get your thoughts on you know we talked about the the kind of level setting for for this webinar and kind of keeping this fairly high level which i think you've done and kind of given us an, an introduction um what can folks do if they're interested in kind of going deeper like because there's a lot of technical depth behind and, and i appreciate you kind of simplifying it or at least kind of you know giving us that that intro level but what would you recommend um you know for folks who are interested in kind of going a bit deeper than than we've done in in the past you know 25 minutes or so yeah no so that's great and if you don't know cumulo you'll get to know us by talking to us because we would be happy to help you and Fact, that's what we do, even if it's not about our platform. There's a lot of things you can do and you should be aware of when it comes to a security posture that will help defend against ransomware or other threats. So, you know, we can keep the conversation going. We have a fantastic customer success team that knows a tremendous amount about permissions and, you know, two factor authentication and all kinds of other things you generally need to know anyway about endpoint protection and just keeping your, your data safe. Um, in addition to all that, We've got a great white paper that I think Andrew has a link to, or he'll send that out, that talks about what we described today in, in deeper terms, more practical terms of like, what can I do, and some sample scripts and some other things that, that uh, you can do. So it's definitely worth a look to sort of get a better uh, sense of the scope of, uh, you know, what, what's available to you. And of course, we're happy to help with any of those things. So, you know, just, just reach out and we'd be happy to walk through it with you. Great. Thank you, David. And I think that's my cue to uh, to share my screen again, just really briefly as as we start to wrap up here. Um, you know, as David mentioned, like we do want to continue this conversation. We're glad to talk with any of you individually. Um, you know, if you're an existing Cumulo customer, you know, you'll have customer success and support resources available to you. Um, all of our customers have, you know, dedicated Slack channels and, and um, you know, conversation channels with us. So you don't have to file support tickets and go through a complicated, um, you know, kind of phone support entitlement kind of game, you can just like reach out directly on Slack to to the channels um, that you've got. If you're not yet a Cumulo customer and you're just interested in exploring, that's fine too. We can get you set up with proof of concepts or, or free trials, uh, things like that. We can also kind of go into much more technical depth with you. Um, so glad to kind of continue this conversation and go deeper, um, however you all would like. Um, as, as we sort of wrap up here, um, you know, David mentioned the white paper, which we'll get out to everybody. There's additional information on Recover Q and, and on our product um, and platform generally on our website. Um, like I mentioned, you know, please 
um, hold us to what we're talking about here. So request a technical deep dive. We'd love to kind of have, you know, the tough questions and the technical questions. We can set up, you know, demos or trials, that kind of thing. Um, just logistically for, for higher ed IT folks, um, I think many of us are going to uh, be attending the Educause conference uh, next week. Um, I'm looking forward to doing that in person. I know some people are going to be on uh, the virtual conference. So we are not holding one of these sessions uh, next Wednesday. We're going to skip. Um, and so we'll join, um, you know, we'll have some more uh, in this webinar series coming up in November. We're going to be talking about things like research computing, uh, supporting video surveillance use cases. We're also going to talk about kind of medical imaging use cases. So really addressing a whole range range of, of different use cases, but all centered on uh, the Cumulo file data platform. Uh, so with that, I think we're going to wrap up for the day. Um, David, I don't know if there's anything, any last comments you'd like to leave us with around RecoverQ or around ransomware, but uh, thank you so much for your time and everything you shared today. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And, and just remember that we're here to help. So um, we'd be happy to connect with you and tell you more about RecoverQ and, and how we can help you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, David. Thank you all for joining us. Again, reach out if you've got any specific questions or if there's anything you'd like to know more about that we didn't get a chance to cover today. Thanks again, David. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us.